uh, I've tried to wait a little bit um, to give folks a, a chance to, to join us, including one of our panelists. Um, but I think we'll go ahead and get started because I'd like to, um, I have a few things that I want to present, but I also want to give our panel its due time and due time to your questions if we can. So uh, my name's Eric Onsted. I'm the director of the Global Education Office, which is the office that supports undergraduate study abroad at Vanderbilt. And um, we're here to guide your students basically through every aspect of prepping for study abroad and helping to support them while they're abroad. Um, and so um, I'm gonna get started. Again, I'm gonna try to rush through this. Um, if there, hopefully we'll have time at the end for questions if there's anything you want to come back to, but um, I'm gonna move quick. All right, so um, just quickly, I'll say that pre-pandemic, we had about 50% of our students at Vanderbilt studying abroad. So more or less any student pursuing any major can study abroad, but it does require planning. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why we're here, is to help with that planning. Um, when do students study abroad? Students can study abroad any time after they've put in two semesters at Vanderbilt. And generally that means they can start applying to study abroad the semester before they actually go. And so after one semester at Vanderbilt, you can start planning. So for a first year student, what that means is you can start studying abroad in the summer after your first year, so as a rising, uh, rising sophomore. The most common time to study abroad is probably as juniors, but I am seeing a lot of interest among sophomores right now, um, for, uh, among first years for studying abroad as sophomores. Um, but 70% of Vanderbilt students do, for, do so for um, a semester or more, and 30% um, generally do so during the summer. And one of the reasons for that is that we do pro provide um, a lot of support um, for the semester-long study abroad and do view that as one of the most, in, most um, the best ways to engage, and actually all of our panelists have spent an entire semester abroad, um, and so we'll get to hear what that experience is like. Um, there are 140, more than 140 programs in 45 countries. Um, students can go to all seven continents, yes, that includes Antarctica, um, as, as study abroad um, opportunities. Um, most of these are now open again um, post-COVID. In our first semester post-COVID, which was the fall 2021, we only had eight countries available, uh, but most of these countries are now available. China, Russia, those are two that we currently aren't sending students to, but um, most are available. One of the things that I'd like to note very quickly for you, because our panelists will be talking about is we work with a lot of different partners to offer study abroad opportunities to Vanderbilt. Chances are, if you hear an acronym on the stage today, it will be a study abroad partner. Um, and so I think we have, what, CIEE represented among the panelists. Um, yep, uh, heavily represented among the panelists. And then, um, <laughs> and, and Shannon on the end worked with Dickinson, which uh, the logo is on the board, right behind you, Shannon. Um, so our values in, in kind of designing study abroad for Vanderbilt students are accessibility, offering compelling learning opportunities, and offering um, support to go with the challenge that students will face. Um, so very quickly, I want to run through what we mean by accessibility, and there are multiple things we mean. We mean that it's academically accessible. There are a wide range of programs and courses available. Um, courses can count toward majors and minors, and that students can graduate on time. Um, we've done multiple studies through the years and found effectively no difference between the stu study abroad population and the population of students that don't study abroad in their time to graduation. So um, we feel like we're doing a reasonably good job on making sure students can graduate on time, but a lot of the effort is put out by students, as we'll talk about later. Um, we also want it to be financially accessible. Um, so during the academic year, regular financial aid applies, whether it's need-based or merit-based. And in the summer, there is no regular financial aid, but we do have some need-based competitive um, scholarships that can fund up to $8,500 um, that are offered through our Global Summer Fellowship Program. Um, we also uh, strive to support all students, including first-time travelers who've never been abroad, students with disabilities, students who have, may have identity-based concerns about studying abroad, um, students who are managing medical or mental health care, um, international students who might be studying abroad at Vanderbilt and then want to turn around and study abroad in another location, um, and more. Um, we also are really hoping to offer our students compelling experiences abroad, academic and otherwise. Um, and so we work with the faculty and deans of our undergraduate colleges to ensure that students have a wide range of opportunities. I mentioned, I think, more than 140 programs are currently open. Um, and 
studying abroad at Vanderbilt um, can definitely be much more than just going to classes and traveling on the weekends. It can offer a meaningful cultural exchange, uh, the chance to build critical skills, access to different perspectives on the world's problems, and the opportunity to build knowledge and credentials and to make discoveries through research, internship, and volunteer opportunities. But what I want to highlight today, especially because in the room where many of us parents, um, is the opportunity for personal growth. Um, and so um, Vanderbilt's model is, uh, motto is um, dare to grow. And so um, that's also appropriate that we highlight that right now. Um, and I just want to take a, a minute to say that we've surveyed returning students from studying abroad and 97% tell us that their experiences overseas help them develop confidence and independence. And the skills that students gain over while they're overseas are increasingly in demand in the workplace. And nationwide studies have shown that 80% of study abroad students say that studying abroad helped them develop confidence in their skills in that first job out of school. Um, I'll also highlight, because you'll probably hear more about it at Parents Weekend and more from your student, um, that Vanderbilt study abroad can be the immersive experience of the Immersion Vanderbilt re graduation requirement. And if you haven't heard about Immersion Vanderbilt yet, it's a graduation requirement that aims to give every Vanderbilt student the opportunity to engage in three transformative practices. An experiential learning experience where they can learn by doing and reflecting on that experience, mentored relationships with faculty and staff, and to demonstrate their lear learning by putting it all together into a culminating project. Um, and so study abroad offers you the chance to do experiential learning and to reflect on it um, through mentorship from our global education office staff. And so it can serve as the immersive experience um, element of the Immersion Vanderbilt plan. And down below you can see the four parts, uh, four requirements of the Immersion Vanderbilt plan. Um, finally, one of our core values is to support students through the challenge of studying abroad. Um, we continue to track the challenges associated with COVID-19, um, but I won't focus on that much here because it has been less and less of a challenge to students as we've gone along um, post uh, reopening. Again, we reopened in fall of 2021 um, to study abroad. Uh, and um, what I'd like to highlight though is that Regardless of, of, of the challenges posed to the world by COVID-19, studying abroad and preparing to study abroad are both challenging efforts for students. Um, in terms of preparing for study abroad, there's academic planning, there's finding the right program and the right court that has the right courses to keep you on track academically. There's navigating your personal interests uh, against your friend's decision making. Uh, there are a lot of different um, pathways for students to to explore and um, a lot of challenges to getting it done um, in a timely manner, including logistics like getting a visa, purchasing airplane tickets, um, and so on. And I imagine that um, at least one or two of you have at least had a, some experience um, with challenging visa issues. For example, the COVID was not easy on visa processing. Um, and then um, when you're abroad, Everything is new. There are lots of adjustments to make. Um, and so in both cases, there are um, some, some real challenges that students are facing. So we don't want to act like everything is, is easy peasy when it comes to study abroad. Um, and I hope that um, you'll hear from our panelists today too about some of the challenges they faced. Um, one of the things that parents can do is to work with us to um, kind of center the student and to um, give them the chance to learn and grow from these experiences of doing their planning and doing their engagement once they're abroad. Um, but this brings us to health and wellness um, is an important piece of how we prepare students to study abroad. Um, studying abroad in general is not inherently less safe than being in Nashville, but the context is unfamiliar. And students need resources, especially those students who might be managing um, ongoing care for any kind of condition um, in order to, um, to, be, to be successful. So at Vanderbilt, we work with preparation and um, preparing students and giving them resources before they go and trying to ease the way for them. And um, we have a couple of colleagues here from the Office of Global Safety at Vanderbilt who are a big part of that effort and we may hear from them later. Um, and then um, we also have on the ground support both from Vanderbilt's Global Education Office staff from our Office of Global Safety, 
uh, sorry, from, from our local partners, um, but also direct Vanderbilt response from the Office of Global Safety, um, from, from our GEO staff as well. Um, so we're trying to support students all the way through. Um, I want to highlight some next steps you can take as parents. That would be checking out our website is the main one, and then having your student look out for our study abroad overview sessions, which will be starting um, in October and will be offered weekly in our office. Finally, before we get to our presentation, um, uh, to our main attraction, um, if you want to learn more about Immersion Vanderbilt, there are several events today um, that allow you to connect with our parent office, which is the Office of Experiential Learning and Immersion Vanderbilt. And those include an uh, information session at 12.30 in this room. I wrote 12, it's 12.30. Um, a resource fair that's going until 2 p.m. in the Student Life Center ballroom and outside the ballroom. And then an open house from 2 to 3.30 in um, Student Life Center Suite 109 and Suite 103. And if you have questions for us, we'll be there as well. So, all right, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this will just be a pretty backdrop um, as we turn to the panel um, presentation part of our, of our program. So, uh, these are four students who studied abroad with us in the past year, and um, I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves rather than do it myself. They can do a better job than I can. So I'm gonna ask each of you to introduce yourself um, by name, your majors, minors, whether you're pre-med, that kind of thing, anything else that might be relevant about you. Um, and then let us know when you studied abroad and just some basic characteristics of your study abroad program. Do you wanna give us a start, Susanna? Okay. Yeah, uh, my name's Susanna. I am a senior. I'm an HOD major, so human and organizational development with minors in econ and business. Um, I recently studied abroad in the spring. I was part of a program called CIEE Open Campus. And through that program, they have 15, around 15 cities that you can spend six weeks in, in different, um, you have three blocks for the semester. And I chose to spend my semester with six weeks in Berlin and then 12 weeks in Cape Town, South Africa. My name is Sebastian Harkness. I'm also a senior. Um, I studied abroad last spring in Madrid. I was also on a CIEE program called um, Engineering and Society and I'm studying mechanical engineering and math here at Vanderbilt. Um, hi, I'm Hannah, and I am a neuroscience major. Um, something that might be relevant later is I used to be a biology major, and um, I studied with CIEE Seoul in Korea, South Korea, um, and yeah, I, it, was, it was great. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Shannon. I am also a senior. I am a double major in computer science and math, minoring in German studies and flute performance. Um, I studied abroad in the spring at, in Germany through the Dickinson and Bremen program. Uh, brief characteristic, it was in Bremen. <laughs> um, uh, the first two months were language immersion and then the final four were um, university. And I also have a chronic illness and take a lot of medication. I'm not gonna go too deep into that, but just so you know, there is support for that and I managed quite successfully and didn't have any problems. Wonderful. Um, let's see, let's start at the beginning. When you were selecting your program, could you tell us what were your primary goals for your study abroad experience? And then building on that, how and why you chose the program you ended up choosing? And we could go in the same order. So I pretty quickly became set on going to South Africa. A lot of reasons for that were I wanted to go somewhere far from home, um, very different from the traditional study abroad experience, I would say. I was excited that I knew no one who was going there. And from talking to alumni of the programs, it just had kind of a sense of adventure and almost limitless possibilities that I was excited about. And then the last kind of layer, when you go to Cape Town, you are pretty much in South Africa for the duration of the semester. And so I was really excited to kind of put down roots, meet people from there, and fully experience like the history and culture versus hopping around and getting to experience a lot of different places. So I was really pleased that as an engineering major studying mechanical engineering, I you know, had the opportunity to go abroad. Um, the engineering curriculum is quite structured and fixed. There's a lot of core classes you need to take in a certain sequence. Um, and I believe at a lot of universities, it can certainly be a challenge to incorporate a study abroad 
um, you know, semester into your four years at university. So looking at the programs, there are certain programs designed for engineers, primarily uh, CIE, Engineering and Society. Um, so they operate that program out of Madrid, uh, and then there are a couple other programs that are offered to engineers. So I basically kind of started with, you know, what, what allows me to stay on track to study engineering, to graduate in four years. Um, and then from there, you know, Madrid is a fantastic city, which I'm sure we'll get to talk about. Um, and I was really excited to, to be able to go on that program. Yeah, I can definitely sympathize with that because I used to also be a biomedical engineering major and I was like, there's no way. Um, but they definitely do have ways for you to study abroad as an engineer. Um, I, at the time of choosing what program I was going to, I did like recently switch into biology. And so I was looking at the arts and science programs and it was also fall 2021. That was like when I was going to study abroad. So we didn't have too many options to choose from, which helped me because I'm an indecisive person. Um, and it just so happened that Seoul, Korea, like, just opened up for study abroad for our school, as far as I knew. Um, and so I was like, oh, yeah, I would love to be a part of, like, the first group that gets to go to Korea. And also, like Savannah said, I liked, like, the idea of going somewhere far from home, because I'm also from Nashville, so I've been here for a long time now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I thought it was cool that I didn't know a lot of people that were going, and so I just thought it would be a very fun kind of just like completely new experience for me. So I like started the study abroad process rather late. Um, I procrastinate everything, guys. <laughs> but for me, like a lot of friends were studying abroad junior spring semesters, like I think the most common study abroad time. Maybe that's wrong, I don't know. Um, but I've been interested in learning German for a very, very long time. I got to college, minored in German, was studying it. So my primary goal was language immersion. And something special about the Dickinson and Bremen program is its direct enrollment into the German university. So my classes were in German. I was like a German student. I had, it was, yeah. <laughs> um, let's actually maybe just follow on with that thought. Um, what were the academics like on your program? We can come back in reverse order. Did you need to adapt to a new system? And I think for Shannon, the answer will definitely be absolutely. But. Yeah, so German university is very different from American university. First of all, the semester, um, the summer semester is from April through September, and the winter semester is October through February. So very different schedule. Um, the way it works is you have three months of lecture, and then you have three months to basically do papers. Um, I had to basically do mine in one month, but that was fairly manageable, but that's just sort of the way German university is structured. Also, classes are usually only once a week, and they're like two to four hours instead of having multiple meeting times like we do in America. Yeah, for me, I think the biggest academic change I had to make was that um, in Korea, well, first thing, I guess this is because of COVID, but everything was online. Um, but also, um, for their exams, they only have one midterm and one final, and so, a lot of the time was spent like not doing too much studying until like the week before the midterm or the week before the final. I promise it's not just me. Um, I saw it with the other students too. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a slightly different structure there than how we have it at Vandy. So, yeah. yeah, I would just echo a lot of you know what they said. In Spain, similar structure. There's not a lot of kind of continuous homework assignments and projects throughout the semester, um, which I think really puts it on the students to be diligent in keeping up with the material, doing the work. You know, they would assign readings or problem sets, but you know, you don't really hand them in. They're not graded, um, and then your grade really just comes down to a big culminating final exam. So, you know, in that sense, it can be a bit more pressure towards the end of the semester, and perhaps you want to be, you know, finishing exploring the country and having fun. Um, but definitely, you know, a lot of independence, you know, was was focused on you know being a diligent student and, and getting your work done. Uh, mine was structured a little bit differently because I was in a block program, so that meant all of my classes started and finished within six weeks. So I was taking two classes at once for each block. In Berlin, I, for that first six weeks, I took two, and then once I moved to Cape Town, my, I took a class alongside something called service learning, where I was interning at a nonprofit in a township near one, uh, our dorms, and I would work there around 12 hours a week and then take night classes to go along with it. And so my experience probably looked a little different. I will say CIE did a very good job of all of the courses I took, especially with the location change, 
were location specific. So I took like sustainability classes in Berlin, um, classes related to the sociology of protest in Cape Town. And then that service learning course was also Cape Town. So very intensive, very short, but they did a good job of making them meaningful and having a reason for why they were where they were. Great, thank you. Um, what was the highlight of your time abroad? And uh, yeah, we pass it back to Sebastian if you want. Um, sure. <laughs> Um, I don't think there was one kind of specific moment that was really the highlight of my time abroad. I think generally it was when I had gotten com like comfortable in Madrid, in Spain. I kind of had a routine down. I had made friends. I knew my way to campus, to classes, and I just really kind of felt at home. You know, it, there's definitely kind of a steep kind of learning curve, if you will, moving to a new country and a new culture, surrounded by people speaking a different language. So I think maybe about a couple weeks in or, or halfway through, perhaps, you know, there was just a time where I was walking around the city getting lunch and I kind of was just looking around and I realized that, you know, I'm comfortable. I know where I am. I know the city. I know how things work here. Um, and I think that was definitely just a really kind of great feeling to, to finally kind of feel at home, if you will. Yeah, I definitely agree wholeheartedly with that because I had that moment as I was like taking the subway around Seoul and then also like flying out to Busan, which is on the other side of Korea. Um, and I think one of my favorite parts in general of being in Korea was that like every like area of the country, because it is a relatively small country, was so accessible. Um, and so I was able to visit many, many different cities around the country while still being able to take classes because they were online. Um, and so just like as a whole, I think just getting comfortable with the culture there and the area there was a big, big highlight for me. For me, a big highlight was um, public transit in Germany is so much better than it is in America. <laughs> so like, Everything is so walkable. You can bus to different places. Like I took ballet classes in like a completely different part of town and I just had to take a bus and it was so convenient. So yeah. Great. I think for me, my program had around 15 people, so it was really small. And once we got to where we knew each other very well and kind of were engaging with the city in a way where everything else seemed familiar too, it became very exciting. Um, we were, it was tradition to do a lot of sunrise hikes or like sunset surfing, very Cape Town, but um, just things that were very adventurous and outdoorsy and then to come back and just be exhausted from being in like such a beautiful place but with people who were quickly familiar was something I loved. Wonderful. Let's do the flip side then. What was a challenge that you faced while you were abroad and kind of um, what did you learn from the experience of navigating that challenge? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, for me, switching from Berlin to Cape Town was a big jump. Going from that, the U-Bahn in Berlin is so seamless and at all times, day and night, safe. I was able to like explore places alone. I felt like I could go anywhere and do anything. And then going to Cape Town, where our, the majority of my first week there was safety briefings and discussions of not, uh, especially as a woman, but just as a young person, not being able to go anywhere alone was a very big jump for me. Um, Outside of that, just living in Berlin and Cape Town, they have such rich recent histories that are very um, kind of invasive in the present culture. And so I think living in places that ha are having such heavy but also just very meaningful conversations is something that I wasn't ready for, but was something that like, I'm very appreciative now. Yeah, so for me, I think my biggest challenge was uh, to get back to the public transit side of things. We had to take multiple trains to get to classes, to get to the campuses. Um, the university I studied at wasn't actually in Madrid. All the students lived in Madrid, but it was outside. There were two campuses in the city of Leganes and Hitafe. And so to get there, I had to walk to a subway station and take a subway and transfer to another train to get to Atocha, which is like the main train station in Madrid. And then I would take like a local commuter train about uh, 30 or 40 minutes outside of the city. And then there was an additional walk uh, to get to the campus. And to get between campuses, there was a public bus that I would take. So sometimes I'd have classes on different campuses. So my daily commute would be a big circle, going to one campus, taking the bus to another campus, and then commuting a different route back. So definitely the first week, I got lost a lot of times. And I used my poor Spanish skills to ask a lot of people for directions and help. Uh, one time, I took the bus to the end of the line. And the bus driver kicked me off, and I ordered an Uber back to campus because I did not know where I was going. So public transit's a big factor um, and really impacts your day-to-day -day life when you're abroad. Um, I think my biggest challenge is a little bit unorthodox, but 
I went to the hospital in Korea, and then I was on crutches for six weeks, which your kids probably will not have to do. Um, but through that learning experience, I definitely, one thing that I completely did not expect out of my experience from being abroad is learning so much about the healthcare system there um, and really just having to navigate the language barrier um, because I do not know a word of Korean. Um, and like really, really having to interact with a lot of people who are trying to help you, but they don't know English and there's just like a lot to learn from that kind of experience and just constantly having to be in contact with people in healthcare, using translation tools, and also being in contact with the people here at the GEO, um, and as well as like the program leaders at CIEE there. They were all very, very helpful in helping me navigate that, as well as like the friends that I had made there. The connections that I had with them just grew all the more deeper because like, I guess through adversity just builds like a lot of friendships because you these people are there for you in a time that you really can't do anything else. Um, and so like I don't think of that time as like a horrible time, but it definitely was a challenge um, in the moment, but I definitely think I grew a lot from it. And so I really value my time in Seoul for that reason as well. Um, for me, I think one of the biggest ones was I was the only Vanderbilt student on my program. There were like six other students from Dickinson um, who all knew each other, and then here I am, the only Vanderbilt student. So I sort of lacked that like safety net of, oh, we're all from Vanderbilt, we all have this common experience and common ground. Um, but it made me like have to sort of go out of my comfort zone and try to meet more German people. I ended up in like a massive Erasmus uh, WhatsApp group at one point, because I made friends with another international student in one of my German classes, because we were the only two foreigners. <laughs> so, like that kind of connection. I also did like a study, there is, um, the, the University of Bremen has the study buddy program, where you can get paired with another student in your major, a local student, it's for international students and local students to sort of pair off. And he had like a large group of German friends, um, and I would hang out with them on campus. They invited me to go rock climbing at one point. Wonderful. Um, Susanna, I'd like to follow up with you specifically because of um, your Cape Town experience and you mentioned all the safety briefings and not being able to go out alone. How did you feel on a day-to-day -day basis about your personal safety? Um, is there any, anything else you might want to follow up on? Um, you know, I, I don't know how many parents um, hearts seized when you mentioned um, the safety, but I think it, it's worth also talking about your personal experience there. Yeah, I think with Cape Town specifically, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of poverty in Cape Town, and with poverty often comes crime. And I think with a lot of our safety briefings was teaching us just to be vigilant. And I think pretty quickly, it was, I don't, I don't think that anyone should be scared to go to somewhere like Cape Town or somewhere that has this like safety warning next to it. I think just as in Madrid or in very crowded places, just being vigilant was enough there. It's not like I was living in fear to walk outside my dorm. There's I felt very safe. I felt like it was different and I was kind of scared of the differences, but less like the people in the environment. Um, a lot of our safety briefings too had to do with most people who come to Cape Town, I would say, come with some adventurous like aspirations. And so a lot of the safety was around that. Like I went shark diving, bungee jumping, all the things. So there's a lot of safety briefings there and I definitely felt more unsafe in things that I put myself in <laughs> than the actual culture and place itself, so. Great, thank you. If anybody else wants to comment on, on how they felt on a day-to-day -day basis, that'd be great too. Um. Um, this is kind of going in the opposite way, but I would like to say at Seoul, I felt the safest I've ever been because the culture there is very much a place of like, what belongs to you belongs to you and like you shouldn't be in anyone's way ever and so, I've had friends and myself like lose items like phones, wallets, purses, everything, and they were always returned to you. Um, it's a very much a culture of like respecting other people and just kind of like keeping to yourself, which can be good and bad in some ways. But from a safety perspective, um, I always felt very like at home there. Thank you. Um, how did you explore, and this would be a question for everybody, how did you explore your host country outside the classroom? What kinds of things were you, were you doing? What was kind of daily life like? Um, we've heard a couple of examples of, of activities that you were doing, but how did you kind of intentionally explore on your own more than with the program? 
I can start with this one. So just to mention the program, so CIE did um, kind of do sponsored events throughout the semester. So there were various trips and, you know, certain restaurants in Madrid and, you know, small towns and stuff nearby within, you know, an hour train ride or bus ride that they would kind of encourage and, and run a program to, which uh, I did go on a few of those. And it was great, you know, you got to meet a lot of people in the program. The program I was on had over 100 people, maybe 200 people. So, you know, you don't meet everyone the first day. And it's people from Vanderbilt, from all of the other institutions, um, and, you know, other, other students from other international countries. So that was great in, like, meeting students. In terms of, you know, exploring Spain, I just think you got to be curious, right? Like, I was in a program, fortunately, with a lot of Vanderbilt students, people I had known before. So it's very easy to, you know, plan out a trip. Madrid's a very central city with great public transit, great trains and buses to lots of towns. I know I took a trip to Segovia, I took a trip to Toledo, um, Alcala, they're all nearby. And you know, each of these cities just offer really kind of interesting sites. And some of them are kind of more off the beaten trail, right? They're not so touristy as perhaps Madrid or, or Seoul is. Um, so you really kind of get to experience more of the culture and see some of the you know, lesser seen parts of the country. Um, so my program also did a few sponsored trips. We went on a week-long trip to Vienna, which was pretty cool, although it's technically in Austria, so not my host country. But they speak German, so <laughs> there's a lot of similarities. Uh, then we also went to see a musical in Hamburg called The Reeperbahn, which was like about the history of a certain area of Hamburg. Um, and I also did a lot of solo traveling, which was very new to me. I come from a relatively large family, so I'm used to traveling in big groups. But I went to Cologne um, and explored there for a couple days. I went to Freiburg in the Black Forest. Black Forest is perhaps one of my favorite places in the world now because the hiking is just so incredible. It's a gorgeous part of the country. Um, and yeah, it was, especially in Germany for the summer, they did this nine euro ticket where you could take the regional trains anywhere in the country for only nine euros. Um, so that lets you explore a lot of the country for cheap. Um, yeah, I also do want to comment on the sponsored trips that we had at my CIE program. My favorite thing that we did was they like split us in groups of three and then made us go on a scavenger hunt around the city of Seoul, which was super fun because um, we just, it was like an instant way, like one week into the program where we got to see a lot of the big like landmarks and attractions of the city. Um, but besides that, I would say most of my traveling did happen outside of the program anyways. And um, a lot of them happened through going on hiking trips. Um, my favorite place in the world is now Halasan Mountain, which is in Jeju um, Island on Korea. And it's like the tallest mountain there. And once again, like super beautiful and everything. But yeah, definitely it came down to a lot of like self-planning and organizing with the people that you know, people that you meet, um, and kind of just like being trusting that these people are gonna stick by you and um, like be good housemates for the weekend or so. Um, but yeah, and another thing is also like paying attention to the holidays that happen there because those offered like a great opportunity to kind of like celebrate with the people of Korea um, of the country and kind of celebrate their culture while also like being in the places that they wanted to be in. So I went to Jeju during their Chuseok weekend, which is like their Thanksgiving basically. And so we saw a lot of like Korean families all over the place and it was really, really fun. So yeah. Um, for me, while I was in Berlin, I did a lot of traveling and Germany was pretty shut down for, I was there starting January 2nd. So it was pretty, not shut down is too extreme, but it was pretty uh, limited in the options of things you could do. And so we would travel most weekends while I was in Germany. And that was great. Knowing I was in Europe for a short amount of time made me kind of excited to make the most of it. Um, once in Cape Town, our, my school did a great job of organizing events, but the people of Cape Town were also just so excited. Anytime I met someone and would mention that I was staying for a long amount of time, that was rare for them. They're used to a lot of people coming in for a safari or coming in for a week, of, week or two, and they were excited just to have kind of American students who chose to be there, if that makes sense, especially the UCT students that I met. And so it was a lot of like barbecues at people's houses, going on hikes with friends from UCT, or even I went on a camping trip with people. Very local to Cape Town was a lot of my exploring, but it was with the people who were from there, so that was very exciting. Wonderful, thank you. Um, 
What is something that living and studying abroad has taught you about yourself? And if there's anything um, that from your study abroad experience that you want to carry forward in your life, um, please feel free to comment on that as well. All right, that is a deep question. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're, 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 we're getting close to the end. So, yeah, you know, no, we I get deeper. I do think one of the biggest things that came from my experience, and this may kind of be a personal thing because I feel like I learned a lot from the friendships that I did make. And like I said, through like my injury and a lot of the harrowing experience there, like I became very, very close with a select like few people. Um, they taught me a lot about like how to be introspective and like really reflect on what's going on in my life and like be present in the moment, but also be thinking about the future at the same time because that's something that I struggled with while I was there. Um, kind of struggling with like thinking about where my career was going um, while still trying to like enjoy everything in Korea while I was there. And so something that I've been able to kind of continue thinking about after Korea is like continuing to be very present while being very like cognizant of what's going on around me and what's going on in terms of like my own emotions, my own feelings. And I think that's something that I try to share with my friends all the time here. Um, for me, I definitely have to go with independence. Again, I come from a big family, so living alone in a foreign country. I lived in a student apartment by myself. Uh, and there were other Dickinson students in like the same apartment complex. It's a little hard to describe, but um, so like we would meet up on occasion to cook dinner together or whatever else. But it was a lot of sort of being on my own, managing my own schedule because German classes are again, only once a week for a few hours. You have a lot of free time. So I tried to find like things in the city, like club sports or joining a ballet class, that kind of thing to sort of fill that time because I had so much of it and it was kind of daunting at first. Yeah, for me, I think I learned a lot about independence. I think um, being exposed to a lot of different intense conversations and histories was something that revealed a lot of my own ignorance and bias and like in the most positive way I'm so glad that that happened um, and then I think finally just I learned to appreciate a lot of people from different colleges and learned a lot about their experience and realized how unique the Vandy experience is and just how exciting it is to be with people from different backgrounds in the college setting. I think for me, the, the part of how students kind of hold themselves and interact with each other on a college campus in Spain and in Madrid is particularly unique. I think that here um, at Vanderbilt and in the States, it's very common for students to uh, affiliate themselves with a group or organization, be it you know a fraternity or a sports team or a certain club, um, and largely interact with the same social circle and, and kind of only identify with that group. Um, but in, in Spain, you know, Everyone's so open and willing to be friendly, to, to introduce you to their friends, to help you on homework, to invite you to you know, events and, and social outings and stuff like that. You know, there was never a moment where I felt alone or unwelcome. You know, every single class, the first day, I had students coming up to me, introducing themselves, welcoming me, saying they're happy that I was in the class, happy I was studying abroad, um, and inviting me out after class for drinks or to get dinner, or to meet their family and friends. And, you know, on, on trips they were taking around the country and stuff like that. So I think it's just so, you know, there's a great attitude to, to welcome everyone with open arms and to kind of celebrate together no matter where you're from or, or who you are, um, which is definitely a big difference, which I really enjoyed. Great, wonderful. Um, this is more or less the last question. We might squeeze one more in, but um, has studying abroad caused you to change your, your vision for your future um, to see what you might do with your life in a different way, or has it helped you clarify things, or how do you think um, going forward your study abroad will continue to inform your life? Uh, I am considering going abroad in Germany again um, through like the Congress Bundestag um, Young Professionals program, which is like an exchange where American and German young professionals go and like live and work in the opposite country for a year. Um, and I'm considering doing that. I also would like to work um, at a STEM company that has sort of like offices in Germany for like the possibility of occasionally having to go visit Germany and um, use my German knowledge and language skills to sort of navigate that. Um, through my experience in Korea, I like 
between the people that I met at the university there as well as people who are also studying abroad from other universities in the US, I was exposed to a lot of different career paths that I had not known about before, especially like just career paths that were not necessarily like exposed to at Vandy. Um, and so I actually did decide to kind of like change the trajectory of what I'm doing and I learned about user experience design and um, all of what that, that entails and so I've been working on kind of building a portfolio for myself and I aim on like kind of going into that after graduation. I think that spending, you know, the amount of time that all of us did abroad, you know, I was there for five or six months, just the sheer amount of time to immerse yourself in the culture really teaches you a lot about, you know, these people live completely different lives in a completely different part of the world in a different country. And that, you know, obviously we have our great lives here and, and we're very happy and Vanderbilt's an excellent place. But, you know, these people have largely never experienced that and there's so much opportunity abroad. So if anything, I think taking away from the experience, just the opportunity and possibility of, you know, working internationally or, you know, any company I work for traveling and, and kind of having relations over there, I think is definitely important just because, you know, it's very different from a two-week vacation where you can go to the beach in, you know, Italy or something like that, but when you really spend four or five months in a country, you know, exploring, meeting people, making friends, you realize, you know, the lives that these people live and it's very, very fascinating and something that I definitely want to carry forward. Um, I went into abroad kind of interested in the nonprofit space, and that's largely why I participated in service learning in Cape Town. And I think after experiencing both different cultures and having um, classes on nonprofit ethics and engaging with different government entities, I kind of learned about myself that I'm interested in public sector and policy less than the nonprofit space. And I think I owe a lot of that to my experience abroad. Wonderful. Well, I hope you'll join me in giving them all a big hand. Um, I really appreciate, really appreciate you all coming out and doing this. Um, personally, I found it wonderful to hear from them. I hope you all did as well. Um, we've now got a few minutes that we can do some Q&A and we can um, widen the circle of our panel. We have some folks from our Office of Global Safety over here. Um, we also have geo advisors and staff, um, including me here, and then we have our, our student panel. So um, we're gonna grab at least, we're gonna grab one of these microphones and have it available for anybody who'd like to ask a question. Um, but I also wanna mention that Sebastian's parents are here, and so if you're interested in hearing what it's like to be the parent of a study abroad student, um, we may also hear from Susan and Steve, so. Yeah, my parents are over there, so. <laughs> nice. are, you, Hi. are you also open to answering questions? Awesome, okay. Hi, so how did you find um, coming back to Vanderbilt and, and reintegrating into the school once you've been away for four or five or six months? I would just like to say that while I was gone, um, for some reason, every single classroom decided to implement Perusal, um, which is like a program where you like annotate papers <laughs> online. I had no idea how to use it, and then I come back and everyone's just on it and doing homework on it, and I was like, I don't know what this is. Um, but besides that, going from like a completely online experience for four to five months and like the like semesters before that were also online and then coming back to Vandy and um, being in an environment where everyone's kind of going back to in person, everyone's taking their masks off, that was very jarring to me because I was coming from an environment where like you never took your mask off unless you were alone in your room. Um, so it definitely took some adjusting, but obviously like we're back into the swing of things now. So. I think, again, mentioning engineering, it's, it's interesting because being a mechanical engineer, we have a very tight cohort. Again, we take the same core classes with the same people for four years, basically. So, you know, we're very close at this point being seniors, and we know everyone who's a mechanical engineer. We know everyone in the major in the program. And about half of us went abroad and half didn't. So I think coming back, it was very interesting to see that the people who were abroad, we kind of have this affinity where we kind of stick together where we have the same teams where we did projects abroad and, and we you know, continue that and we have this experience. And I think to some extent, you know, maybe the people who didn't go abroad, obviously they, they got to take some more of the in-depth classes here at Vanderbilt, which they really wanted to take, which is a big reason for engineers, right? If you want to take a deep dive into a specific you know, vertical of mechanical engineering or, or engineering at all, you kind of have to stay here to take those specific classes. But us who wanted to travel the world and explore, 
um, you know, we got that opportunity as well. So I think it did create perhaps a bit of a, a divide where we have this more worldly experience, if you will, um, taking, you know, all these different engineering classes in Spain. Uh, and, and that's just, you know, not the case for the students who stay here. Um, I had a, a question, and I think a few of you mentioned this, but can you say how many of you were in countries where you had never spoken the language versus, cause, yeah, I, I thought so, right? So maybe, I mean, you can talk about that and even the people you met. So sort of, you know, is my child, you know, destined to go to the place with the language he studied in high school, or is it open? And how? Um, I did not study German in high school. I had only studied it for uh, four semesters here before I went to Germany. Um, my program did have a lot of intensive language courses. German is a very hard language. The grammar is very different from uh, English grammar. So that was a big challenge with speaking specifically. Like writing, you have time to sort of think out your sentences, but when you're speaking, you don't have that time. So there were a lot of like awkward, stilted conversations. And since so many people in Germany speak English, um, they will switch to English if they think you're struggling. And I'm like, I'm trying to learn this language. Can you please continue speaking to me in German, even though my German isn't the best? So that was sort of a experience. <laughs> um, as someone who did not know any Korean, I was begging for the opposite, um, because people would start speaking to me in Korean. Also because I'm Chinese, so they would assume that, uh, they'd be like, oh, like she's East Asian, she probably is Korean. No. Um, and so they would just speak to me in Korean straight out, and I'd be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, and so it would be a struggle at times, like I said, especially in the hospital when it was kind of important um, to know what they were saying. But uh, we definitely got through it. There's a lot of resources out there, like apps that will translate things for you through pictures and stuff. And I thought it was a very fun experience, honestly, like trying to figure out what was going on all the time. Um, and then I also got to get closer with people who did know Korean. And so they would kind of like, be my partners in crime because we would go to restaurants together and they would order everything for me and it was a great experience through that. So Suzanne, I have a question for you. So did you have the opportunity to do six weeks, six weeks, and six weeks and you chose to double up? Can you, are, in retrospect, are you happy you did that or did you wish you had a third place and what was the thinking? Yeah. So. A little bit more about how I chose Open Campus. I pretty quickly was set on going to Cape Town in general, but due to COVID, the full term um, abroad wasn't really an option. And so I knew that I was gonna go through Open Campus. And so as I was looking at Open Campus as a whole, I liked the idea of not being like a tourist and getting a tiny glimpse of three places. I really wanted to kind of settle down, make relationships and feel like I kind of understood where I was. And so immediately I knew that I wanted to do two, at least two um, blocks or six week periods in one location. And so that's how I chose it. I do have friends who did all three and had a great experience. Most of them stayed in Europe for the three. Um, though one of my friends did come down to Cape Town for her last six weeks. I think it is very exciting to see a ton of new places, but there's also this kind of feeling of like hopping around, moving different friend groups, different cultures and languages that is great for someone who loves to explore, but someone who needs kind of that more stable relationships, it could be a little overwhelming. And I just have a really quick question. Um, in your work, did you look at or explore the possibility of doing an internship abroad following your semester? And I'm just curious if that's an option or were you ready to come home and you didn't explore that as an option? Um, since I was there for six months, there were actually two opportunities. You could either extend your time in Germany, depending on like the start of the US semester, to do an internship at the tail end, or in that first two months of intensive language courses, there was a month where you could do an internship. A lot of internships in Germany are only a month long. I did explore doing some of those or like working part-time, um, but like language proficiency can be a big issue in Germany if you're trying to get a job especially in the STEM field, because they want you to have like very fluid German and English, and I have one of those, but not both. So I applied to a couple jobs, um, but like I, nothing really came of it, and I didn't mind too much, because I wanted to focus as well on my studies and everything else. But there are opportunities, especially if you're like doing 
nonprofit or like translating work. I knew some people in my program did like internships with that. Um, if you were also asking about like people who do internships after coming back, um, so for me, I was there junior fall, which is a big recruiting season for a lot of people. And I had a lot of friends who were overseas with me and they would be interviewing like from like three to 5 a.m. every night. Um, and like they, land, they were still able to land very, very good internships for the following summer. And so being abroad doesn't necessarily mean like you kind of cut off those like opportunities when you come back. Um, Cause you can still resume like a lot of your Thing, like a lot of the things that you need to do here and just like do it over there because a lot of things are online and a lot of things are like so flexible now. And I'd also mention that on a lot of programs you can do an internship while you're abroad and that's a great way to make some connections too and maybe set up something for later as well. Can you share a little bit about your living situation? Did you choose a dorm um, to live with a family? And uh, would you do it again, or would you do it differently? I was in a American dorm in Berlin, and that was very, um, had a roommate. It was a pretty great living situation right near our classes. Um, and I would choose again, just based off location. It was only Americans, which kind of limits the interactions with students at University in Berlin. And then for Cape Town, we were at a dorm that was freshman dorms for the University of Cape Town. And so we interacted with a lot of students every day. All of them were 17, which was kind of fun. Um, or big, huge 18th birthday celebrations for that's their 21 there. So there's there a lot going on. But um, I wouldn't change it. I think it's different, but I was in a dorm setting for both of mine. So in my program in Madrid, there were three living options. You could live in a homestay with a Spanish family. You could live in an apartment style situation with likely other Vanderbilt students, or you could live in like a student residence where you'd have your own room, uh, but be surrounded, like a dorm basically, be surrounded by a mix of other students. I did the third option, and I chose that primarily for the location. It was right in the middle of the city. You're surrounded by all the train stations, all the restaurants, all the attractions, everything you'd ever want to do. And you know, it gave me the opportunity to meet lots of other students, um, American students and other students who were studying abroad in Madrid. Um, and I think that my friends who, you know, I had friends who did the other, the other two as well. The, the apartment style was interesting because you could largely close yourself off to just Vanderbilt students, right? You're living with the same students and you largely do everything with them. Uh, that being said, it is kind of like more comfort, comfortable and, and it's kind of safety net there. And then the, the homestay is, you know, up in the air. You don't really know what's to expect, you know, you're going into a family, you don't know where you're gonna live. Um, but largely, I heard really good things about everyone who did that. I think a lot of people bonded really well and, and liked the family and they took care of them. Uh, that being said, I know some of them were further outside of the city, so if you think my commute was bad, it got worse than that. Um, my program also had two options. You could either live in, um, so the university had like apartment style housing for students, that's like subsidized by the government, so it's pretty cheap, small apartments with small kitchens, and you have a little bathroom kind of thing. Um, and I chose that option. The other option were VGs, where you basically would have to find a shared flat with usually German students. Uh, three people in my program did the VG. Two of them had really good experiences. One of them had, for the most part, a good experience, but it was an eight-person flat, and one of the roommates was a little, little out there. Um, so they had a lot of stress like related to that situation. And for me, I don't regret picking the student apartment because you don't have to find it yourself. And with where I was when I was preparing to go abroad, I think I would have found it far too much stress because you have to interview like the other flatmates to see if you want to live in a VG. So it can be a little daunting, especially if you're already like nervous about going abroad. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Uh, You've been uh, exposed to various cultures, and but basically in different universities. I would like to, to know from you, how do you compare those universities to Vanderbilt? And uh, what do you feel grateful for what you're receiving here in Vanderbilt? Um, I think something unique about our pro like my cohort kind of going to Korea is that um, the CIE program that brought like the five Vanderbilt kids that went to Korea with me, 
like we like didn't know each other very well and that like created opportunities for us to kind of spread our roots elsewhere. Um, I did notice that from other universities like UC Irvine, they brought over 600 kids all at once. Um, and so they were very, very tight knit to start with, but I also noticed that they didn't really branch out that much outside of their friend groups that they already had. Um, and so I thought that was one interesting thing and one thing I'm grateful for that I kind of went out on a limb with Andy. Um, for myself, the Uni Bremen, I had one course like called Remote Sensing of the Ocean and Cryosphere, which is one of the coolest courses I've taken. Um, but for the most part, I prefer the American academic system of like more frequent classes, more frequent homework can be annoying, but it's really, really stressful when 100% of your grade is based on one paper you have to write. So I sort of enjoyed coming back to sort of Vanderbilt academics because I found that structure suited me more. Um, but I did like sort of uni life in Germany is a lot more, I don't want to say casual, but people don't like spend their entire lives at the university. There aren't really clubs in the same type that we have in America. So people really spread out across the city and do things in the city rather than just in their little university bubble. I think that's actually a great question because that's something that I thought a lot about when I was abroad. And I kind of came to the conclusion that I view Vanderbilt as like the full package, right? You get to live on campus in these beautiful brand new dorms. We have all these clubs and, you know, geo offices like this that really support students. You have academic assistance. You have, you know, anything you could possibly want, Vanderbilt offers it. You know, sports, academics, travel, like literally a full package, everything you could want. Uh, the university I was studying at in Madrid is a public university and it's really just bare bones. You know, there's a couple buildings. You just go there for classes and you leave. Uh, there's a dining hall that I'd eat at and a gym. That's about it. So, you know, you, you just don't have the, the kind of social involvement in all the clubs is really left to the students to figure out on their own. I would say for me, um, I was really shocked and loved that students in the classrooms I was in weren't really afraid to be wrong, which at Vanderbilt, I feel like often everyone has a really great answer to everything, which makes it kind of high stakes on occasion. And so I loved, like, people would say something that was just very incorrect, and the professor would just correct them quickly and move on in a way that was, like, very approachable, which I really liked. Um, but comparing academics, I thought it was interesting, less about the culture there and more about other students in the room. Our classes, after we'd get assignments and things, I would walk away with, sometimes with other Vanderbilt students, and we'd be like, okay, like, you know, doing work in the morning, knock it out, get it done. And students from other universities often would be very overwhelmed by the workload or very kind of concerned about upcoming tests and assignments. And so it was interesting just to see that Vanderbilt definitely prepared us very well to engage with these courses. Great. So we're over time, but we can maybe give another five minutes before we kind of have to clear the room for the next presentation, which again is from the Office of Experiential Learning and Immersion Vanderbilt, our parent office and the office that um, uh, helps to ensure that students have access to experiential learning opportunities like this and also ensures that they can complete the Immersion Vanderbilt ed, um, graduation requirement. So if there are a couple more questions, we can do that. Otherwise, I may, or that's what I was going to do, was um, ask you a question. But. So it sounds like you're all very happy to be back and you had great times studying abroad, but what is one thing that you'll miss from your study abroad experience or the town in which you lived in um, or your travels that you do miss now that you're back? My answer is really short and concise. Um, bakeries in Germany, incredible. And those are not here and I am sad. <laughs> I was also gonna say food, um, cheap food, cheap drinks, all of that I miss so much. Soccer is really big in Spain. Real Madrid won the Champions League while I was there, and it was insane. I've never seen celebrations like that in the street ever, even for like Super Bowl victory. So definitely the soccer culture. Um, I'm gonna really miss living like walking distance from some of the most beautiful hikes I can think of. And then I got really into surfing, and I'm not accessible here, so. <laughs> Maybe uh, if you would like to um, give some advice to the other parents in the room as somebody who has, um, has had a student go. I hope that that is not too much of an imposition, but. Sure. Um, I'll just say we took a bit of time to figure out um, things like communication. So you definitely want to either go with a SIM card in your phone or get a SIM card as soon as you land. 
And then once you're up and running with that, you want to figure out how are all the family members going to communicate with the student. So we settled on Snapchat. Uh, it was great because you can send texts, you can do audio calls, you can do video, and you can send photographs, and you can save them. So Snapchat was uh, absolutely awesome. And then uh, just the last thing, figure out uh, the cash situation. Uh, we sent Sebastian with some euros, but we didn't want to send very much in case he got robbed. <laughs> um, and uh, you've got to figure out, is your student going to take a credit card? And is there uh, two-factor authentication? Because sometimes they go to make a purchase and they get a text message. Well, now they've got a SIM card with a foreign telephone number, so they're not going to be able to authenticate that purchase. So think about communication and think about payments. Those were two practical things we had to work on. Shannon's parents, do you have any advice to share? <laughs> Sounds good. Yes. Um, is, is the uh, I, Capital One card has been one of the best in the past, yeah, so. I'd also like to echo that just, you know, if, if time and finances <laughs> allow, just plan time to visit your, your um, son or daughter studying abroad and let them show you around their new town and all the places to go. I mean, there's you know, a place our son took us to, which is one of his favorite places. Definitely not a place I would go back to. Um, <laughs> you, you know what place I'm talking about. <laughs> there was a certain bar. Yes. My, I think my shoes are still stuck to the floor. Um, but it was fun. And just you know, letting your, your son and daughter show you their town and take you on the out-of-town experiences. And then also to be able to see what they do as additional extracurricular, other travel. I mean, because Sebastian was in Madrid, you know, Europe is small, so he could hop on you know, Ryanair and be many different places with his friends and travel all over the place and to see those experiences. Now, my husband and I have some trips that we're going to plan and just follow in his footsteps because <laughs> he did some pretty cool trips nice. um, that we'll just follow up nice. on. But I just, you know, echo, it's just a great opportunity to let your son or daughter show you their experiences traveling the world through their eyes. Yeah. And if you can't come visit. Uh, my parents weren't able to come visit me, but I was able to talk some of my Vanderbilt friends who were studying abroad in different countries to come meet me at some certain points when we both had free time. Yeah, and I'd add a corollary to that, which is that, you know, when you brought your student to Vanderbilt for the first time, you probably dropped them off here. And that's maybe not the best approach because as some of them testified to, that was the, the, the time where they were needing to get to know people there the most. And um, as you mentioned, um, if, if you go when they know the place, they can show you around and they can demonstrate what they learned to you. And I think that's uh, gonna be more rewarding for them and for you, so. Well, let's, uh, let's give our panel a, a, another hand. Um, it was great to hear their insights and what they've learned and um, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. All right, enjoy your visit. Bye. Bye.